Hey everybody, we're here today on the campus of Auburn University and we're going to be learning about the Alabama Cooperative Extension System. We'll be traveling the state to learn more about how they're serving the citizens of Alabama and providing safer food products. We're here at Eat South in my downtown Montgomery, Alabama, and we're talking with Bethany O'Rear about the Grow More, Give More project. So Bethany, tell us a little about who you are and where we're at today. Great, thanks, Megan. So um, like you said, I'm Bethany O'Rear. I am a regional extension agent with Alabama Extension, and my primary focus is home grounds. So I work with homeowners who, um, you know, maybe have questions about their um, landscape or about their vegetable garden. And so vegetable gardening is kind of my passion. And um, so we started the Grow More Give More project back in 2020, whenever the pandemic hit. Um, as you can imagine, phone calls, um, as everybody was at home, people were spending more time outdoors. So they really wanted to know more about growing their own food. Um, we weren't able to do that in person, so we figured out that there was a need for that information and we had to come up with a way to get that information to them in whatever means possible. Okay, so how does the program work for so the project? Basically, we break it down into two different sections. So we have the Grow More piece, which is ed an educational component, and that involves um, lots of great digital resources that are um, on uh, our website, aces.edu. And then as an aside, we wanted to include uh, the give more piece, and that's the philanthropic side of the project. And so as we encourage folks to be successful and to grow more, um, we wanted them to give more as well. Mm -hmm. So we encourage folks to plant a little extra and harvest that extra produce and donate it to um, not only to maybe a local food bank or a soup kitchen, but even if you had an uh, elderly neighbor down the street who couldn't grow for themselves, maybe because um, of a financial situation or a physical limitation, uh, we wanted folks to know that those folks needed help too. Um, and those donations counted, and this has continued. So 2020, um, obviously things are kind of moderating and seem to be getting um, improving and, and getting better, but food insecurity still exists. And so therefore, Grow More, Give More is still a very um, important piece of what we do. Uh, so Eat South is a partnership between the city of Montgomery and the nonprofit Eat South, and we educate about, gather people around, and grow good food. And we aim to change the way food travels between the ground and our plates. So why is it so important for you and Eat South to be involved in the Grow More, Give More project? Well, you know, it was a great kind of coming together of goals. Originally, the food we grew here went into our programs. So kids would harvest and make salsa in summer camp, for example, or kale salad in the fall. And then suddenly we had no kids. Um, so we reached out to people in the community and said, do you need food? Uh, and at the same time, Grow More, Give More was starting. So it was a great way yeah. to kind of combine what, what we were doing. Yeah. So here at Eat South, you have um, Master Gardener volunteers that actually help with the Grow More, Give More program. Tell right. us a little bit about how that came to be and what exactly are Master Gardeners? So master gardeners, we affectionately refer to them as an extension of extension. So obviously we can't be everywhere. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, you know, they're kind of that local connection. Um, so master gardeners uh, complete a uh, 15 week training course uh, where we cover uh, several different subjects. Uh, and then we uh, teach them where to find that information. But as part of that um, certification, they complete the coursework um, but they're also required to accrue 50 volunteer hours. And so that is their way of giving back. And once they've cre um, accrued that 50 hours, they're certified. Uh, and then they must maintain uh, a 25 hour total every year um, okay. thereafter. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then an additional 10 uh, hours of education units. 
So everything at Eat South happens because of volunteers and partnerships. And these two beds are designed and managed and maintained by the Capital City Master Gardeners. The entire farm is participating in Grow More, Give More, but these are uh, Montgomery Extension's um, Capital City Master Gardeners Vegetable Demonstration Garden. I will turn it over to Henry Lucas, who is a master gardener and a volunteer here to talk about how these beds are designed and what's going on here. All right. Okay. Uh, what we've got, I've got two different garden beds set up here. This one is a square foot garden program. As you can see in here, we've got a wooden grid here to separate out to each square foot. Part has to take and teach people things that you can put in one square foot. You know, 16 carrots or radishes in that one square foot, where most of the time people think about row gardening, like this one here, you got everything spaced out and you end up using a lot more room than you normally would. And we use a program that tells us exactly how many plants to go in that square foot. And this is to help encourage people to do a small garden in a four by four or three by three raised bed. They can grow a lot of produce for themselves as well as their neighbors, and that's part of the Grow More, Give More program that we're encouraging people to get involved in. That sounds great, all that you're doing to help the community. So how do you see it impacting the community, the Montgomery community? Well, we just actually had somebody walk through while you were filming, just moved in to uh, Montgomery and was asking a lot of questions. Henry was talking about the beds and what Eat South does, and I was able to hand out, hand them some information that I just happened to have brought today uh, about the Master Gardener program mm -hmm. and some of the other programs like our Lunch and Learn. So it's, it uh, helps spread out a lot of information that we're doing in other areas of the community, but we're also doing stuff like working with other community gardens mm -hmm. and sharing information and how you can start a garden without reinventing the wheel or making a lot of mistakes that could be prevented. So it's just a great way to, to educate and to um, share the fruits of our labor. Yeah. So how have you seen Extension personally impact who you are? Who I am? Mm -hmm. Oh, let's see. I I always wanted to go to the Master Gardener program, but mm -hmm. I knew I had to retire first. <laughs> <laughs> I'd work picking tomatoes when I was a little kid mm -hmm. with my parents, and mother always can. So this gave me an opportunity to, to learn a lot. And I, I always, I'm, all, I'm one of those that's always reading and trying to learn something every day. and. There's always something with the Master Gardener program that I'm learning and I'm enjoying and it gives me the opportunity to meet folks out in the community. And um, I'm always learning and I hope I'm helping other people learn and I just enjoy it. And I've made some of the best friends mm -hmm. through the Master Gardener program too. So you pick, you guys come in, you pick the vegetables and then where do, where do you guys take them? Uh, Depending on how many we got, if we just got a small handful mm -hmm. and it's going to be a week or so before we have enough to give to other people or to send up to one of the churches, we'll end up taking it home ourselves. So that's how we share among ourselves mm -hmm. as well because some of our master gardeners don't have gardens like this at home. So we share that produce with them. But other than that, though, we'll take this and put it with Kayla's uh, produce that she's mm -hmm. got to share with one of the uh, kitchens at uh, one of the churches here in town. She takes care of all that for us. And I think our cucumbers, and you can see we've got cucumbers in here. Uh, cucumbers have been very prolific this year for us. She's been able to share a lot of that with it. And our tomatoes are starting to come on and I think she's been picking them a little green so she can hold them a little bit longer until she gets enough of them to share with the church up here. Cool, so how can our students volunteer here so we have had auburn students before mm -hmm. we have never we have never had horticulture or ag students here before that's a good plug so students can get in touch with me okay. at eat south so i'm farmer at eatsouth.org and you know we can work with what they need from their professors mm -hmm. for credit uh and so i would just say get in touch with me tell me what you need and we'll we'll work on yeah, uh, making we'll that happen work. Yeah. yeah cool you know, as I said, vegetable gardening is my passion. Um, that's what I grew up doing, and that's um, and to be able to have a job that uh, that affords me the opportunity to educate people 
and not only to educate them for their own well-being, but to also encourage them to um, kind of think outside of themselves um, and to reach out to others. Uh, it's just a great, it's a win-win. I really, it gives, um, it really gives me satisfaction in what I do every day um, to be able, like I said, to help others know how to grow more and also to give more. Yeah. So do you know how many, how many pounds of food have been donated? So in 2021, um, we had over 36,000 pounds donated, and that is a pretty um, safe number. We actually uh, estimate that it was probably more than that because a lot of folks aren't really, uh, the survey was kind of new, and so folks weren't used to doing that. Um, but yes, yeah, so it was, you know, 36,000 pounds were donated across the state of Alabama. So from your perspective, a student wanting to get into extension, wanting to call this their career field, what, do you, what does a student need to have? What qualities are is extension looking for you think? Um, I would say they should be uh, outgoing. You can't be afraid to get in front of folks. Um, so um, as I mentioned technology has changed some of that but there's still opportunities where you're involved and you're presenting to uh, different classes or different organizations. Um, they also need to be motivated and excited about what they do. Um, we've all sat in that class where maybe the instructor wasn't as passionate or wasn't as interesting and so that was really a dread. Um, but with extension you really should be able to um, be excited, um, be innovative in how you deliver your topic. Um, you also need to be driven or motivated. So I really enjoy what I do every day. Um, like I said, I've been doing it for 10 years. I wouldn't change a thing. I wouldn't go back. Um, no day is the same, and I'm looking forward to that for the rest of my career. That's great, yeah. So Danny, tell us a little bit about you and where we are today. Perfect. My name is Danny Reams, and I'm a Regional Extension Agent for Food Safety and Quality with the Alabama Cooperative Extension System. So we do a lot of things related to food safety, teach a lot of classes, and one of those classes is the Serve Safe class. Um, and it is geared toward restaurants. If you talk to the health department, it's gonna be category three and four establishments mm -hmm. who serve food and require this class in order to operate. Okay, so we're gonna be taking a look at Central's High School's kitchen today and seeing all the safety guidelines and health guidelines that they follow. So can we take a tour? Absolutely. All right. Good morning, Miss Janet. Good morning. How are you? I'm good, how are you? I'm good, Miss Janet. This is Megan. Hi, Megan, Megan, this is Miss Janet. She's the manager of the lunchroom here at Central High School. Hi, Hi Janet. Well, thanks Hi. for hosting us today. And so we're here to learn about the Surf Safe program and okay. learn a bit, a little bit more about what Danny does. So tell me, um, how long ago did you take the Surf Safe course? Do you remember? Uh, it's been four years ago. I am due for renewal in 2023. Okay. And so how do you use it in the kitchen? taking temperatures of all our food, recording that, and cleaning, make sure everything is clean so um, you don't get bacteria and stuff yeah. like that and cross-contaminate stuff yeah. like that. It's all very important. That's what we use okay. all that serve safe for. Yeah. They do a lot with allergens too, I think. Yes, we do. We do a lot. We have a lot of allergies and um, we go over those in the mornings with the, the list of students and make a special diet for those and make sure those, uh, was it seven or nine main allergies that we don't expose the kids to that so they don't get sick. Yeah, okay. So Danny, tell me, go in a little bit more detail about the Serve Safe program. Sure, so Serve Safe is a nationally certified program and exam um, the Federal Food Code requires that a person be on site at all times who has a Food Safety Manager certification. And when the state of Alabama adopted the Federal Food Code, they adopted that as well. So each food service that's category three or four, which means that they are maybe working with raw animal products like raw meats, poultry, or seafood, or they're using repeat use customer utensils, or if they cool and reheat foods for the next day. Those are your category three and four establishments. 
Um, it would also include people with special processes like if they were using ROP packaging, mm -hmm. which is just reduced oxygen packaging like vacuum sealing. Okay. So those establishments have to have somebody on site at all times and it's to make sure that there's a culture of food safety awareness at those establishments. So Megan, one of the things we talk a lot about in Serve Safe is proper hand washing procedure. And that's because so many of the pathogens that make people sick are spread through the fecal oral route, which basically means that somebody's not washed their hands well or not washed them at all after using the bathroom and the contaminants get from their hands into the food of somebody else and they get sick. So Danny, we talked a little bit about temperature controls. Can you and Janet talk to us about the temperature and how important that is for some of your foods? I see we have chicken. We have some grilled chicken yeah. and it needs to be hundred at least 165 um, degrees when you pull it out. Oh, okay, and so they pull it out of the oven and then they check it with just a thermometer? Yes, and um, it, just the tip of the thermometer has to go in. You don't have to stack them up on top of each other to make them read the, the thermometer and um, make sure your probe is clean when you stick it in there. Oh, okay. And that's one thing, they have the proper thermometer for this task. So some thermometers have a larger sensing area and a thin food would be a problem, but they have a probe with a very thin sensing area. And so it's able to measure the temperature of a thin product like this chicken. And then of course, they're gonna wash, rinse and sanitize this because it is a food contact surface. So how, do, how does the kitchen accommodate for food allergies? We keep that food separate from the other food. We have a cutting board just for allergy kids, a thermometer just for that, uh, knives, a whole box with just the stuff for allergy kids so we don't cross contaminate in any kind of way. Okay. And how do you train? How do you train on allergies? Yeah, that has got to be a challenge. So there are eight main allergens. Right now, the legislature did add a ninth allergen that's going to be required on labels in January of 2023. Um, but those account for about 90% of food allergies in the United States, which means there are still 10% of people with allergies to other foods. So if the allergen is one of the top eight, soon to be nine, it's going to be highlighted on the label. It's going to be in a contained statement or it's going to be bold. So it's easy to pick out. But they have children who are coming in with allergies to other foods. So we talk about those allergens, but we also talk a lot about reading labels um, and how important that is because allergens can hide. Let, let's go look at our labels over here. These are our labels uh, that have the ingredients mm -hmm. for what's in the product. And it will say contains wheat for your allergies. It does say this product is produced in a nut free facility. So that helps. Um, our chips, uh, you have to read them. It says contains milk and soy ingredients. On this, on the, the barbecue um, nachos, contains milk ingredients. So these are a few of the things we have to look for as far as in the main allergen mm -hmm. group that we were talking about earlier. Uh, yeah. For so the, the kids. student comes up to you and you discover they have an allergy. So then whoever's um, working in the front would come back and literally look at the labels yes. in real time? Yes. And write down, oh, okay. and make sure that's a lot of info to yes. remember and maintain. So wow. it's not, not just serving the kid their plate and sending them off. You mm -hmm. have to make sure that what they're eating doesn't have that allergy in there because yeah. we don't want any sick Even with kids. chips, you wouldn't have thought it would have had, a, I guess the right. Dorito cheese, but. And even every different flavor. So do they get to pick their flavor? They How can pick out their flavor. That? Oh, wow. And so if it pops up, they have an allergy, will we pull that bag and make sure it's, it's safe for them to eat it? Or we have to take it away and say, no, I'm sorry, you can't have this. This has this product in there and we don't want you to get sick. So Danny, talk to us a little bit more about your work at Extension. You don't just do serve safe training. That's right. We teach food safety classes all the way from consumer level, uh, food preservation and food preparation. 
up to some courses for processors like seafood HACCP, better process controls for acidified food, serve safe obviously. Um, so we really run the whole spectrum of food safety. You do lots of different, wear lots of hats. So what's the best part of working for Extension? The people. I absolutely, on, on both sides, the people that we work with our clients, we're able to help people. Um, you know, especially people who are looking at starting their own business or, or coming out onto the market, doing cottage foods even, which I didn't mention earlier. They're nervous, they don't know where to start and we're able to step in and help them. We help them with the food safety portion of things and then we're able to direct them to other resources and extension that can help them with like the agriculture side of things if they're growing their own produce or the business side. And it's just incredible to be able to make a difference. Hi Danny, we're here in Rockford, Alabama, so you can tell us tell us where we are today. Absolutely. We're at the home of Miss Valerie By. She is a cottage foods producer here in Coosa County. She does a variety of um, baked goods under her cottage foods registration, and so we're going to take a look and see what she does. Awesome, let's go. All right, Megan, we've made it to Miss Valerie's kitchen. Um, Ms. Miss Valerie, this is Megan. Nice Hi, to meet you, Valerie. Megan. We're so excited to be here. So, tell us a little bit about your company. First of all, thank you for coming. I'm Valerie Bice. I'm the owner of Coosa River Cookie Company. I produce cookies, cakes, and other specialty treats. And I'm a cottage food producer. Miss Danny has helped me tremendously. She helped me get everything ready to take to the health department so I could start producing products from my home and start practicing the cottage food law. I have to tell you, Miss Valerie has a really cool story about how she got started with baking that led up to her now having her own home business. I won my first blue ribbon when I was 12 years old through 4-H. I'm a big believer of 4-H. I think all children should participate in 4-H and I had such an amazing extension officer, you know. She got me into um, cooking. She helped me enter the state fair is where I won mm -hmm. my blue ribbon with my applesauce cake. Oh, fun. Too bad you're not making that for us today. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> but we are excited to be here to uh, taste your cookies and see how you work in your kitchen. So Danny, tell us about the cottage food law course. The Alabama Department of Public Health is, is required to inspect and permit any food service operator in the state of Alabama and they don't go into private homes. So that meant that like my grandmother who made the best chocolate cake in the whole world, that is totally my opinion, not extensions, <laughs> um, could not sell her cake to someone who wanted to have it for a birthday party. Um, and the Alabama legislature felt like Alabamians should have that ability, especially with certain foods that are not hazardous, not particularly hazardous. So they passed the first law. Well, that law was actually amended this past year, and they've added a lot of products to the list of things that can be produced. And so where we're coming in now, one, we are re redoing our course so that it reflects the current law, because we teach the current law, because that's really important, in addition to basic food safety. We also offer testing services. So we do pH testing and water activity testing. Um, I'm the contact for that in Alabama for extension. Some products like barbecue sauces, pickles, relishes, uh, dessert sauces have to show that they meet certain requirements so that they would be safe being held outside of refrigerated conditions. So we do that for cottage foods producers as well. So Valerie, how long did it take you to go through the whole process start to finish? It took about a month. Oh, that's not long no, at all. It, it wasn't long. Thanks to Danny. <laughs> for helping me with, you know, getting all the paperwork. She printed off everything at the office mm -hmm. and handed it to me and I took it straight to the health department. So Valerie, how has, like, how have you changed how you work in the kitchen since becoming well, a cottage I have food? learned that um, with the cottage food law, you need to keep the, the um, food that you are going to serve separate from the food that you have at home. You need to keep, you need to keep your food, you know, your products separate, your flour, your sugar, everything yeah. needs to be separate. And also, um, everything needs to be six inches off the floor. Oh, wow. Yeah, which helps, you know, mm -hmm. with cleaning and also pest control. So some things that you can say that she has done very well. 
she washed her hands before she started. And now she's wearing gloves. Mm -hmm. And that is important when you're preparing food for other people and for sale. She also has this really nice food grade packaging. Mm -hmm. It'll protect her product from contamination. And because it is food grade packaging, it has been handled, manufactured and handled in a way that keeps it from being a um, chemical contamination issue. So some packaging that's not food grade may have been an area that was sprayed with pesticides or it may be made with chemicals that can leach into a food mm -hmm. product. It's really important to use food grade packaging. She has also gone an extra step and sealed the cookies in a food grade container. And that's really good. It's gonna hold the moisture in her cookie, but it's also gonna prevent contaminants from getting to the cookie. She also has a really nice Cottage Foods label, mm -hmm. everything in 10 point font. Um, so she's ready to go. So ready she's to ready to go, that's right. How did you know that you had to do this? Like that you had to do a cottage, become a cottage food producer? The extension office. Okay. I knew that you had to have some sort of, you know, that you just couldn't sell goods out of your home. You had to have some kind of certification. And I didn't know exactly what certification that I needed. So I called my local extension agent and it happened to be Danny. Yeah. <laughs> and she called me back and, and with all the information that I needed to help me get started. Okay. So how long have you been selling cookies? I have been selling cookies, I guess, since, um, April. Oh, I well, yeah. see. Fairly yeah. new. Yes. As far as yes, with the cottage food law. Yeah. Okay. So how did you, how did you get into baking cookies? I know you started in 4-H. Yes. But how did it progress? I have, um, I just, I love to do it. I love to cook mm -hmm. and it's just, you know, it was a hobby just, okay. and everyone, you know, how when some things people tell you, well, you, you ought to start trying to sell those or, you, you know, you can make money doing that. So I'm thinking, well, I guess I could. So. Yeah. I reached out and and it's been very nice. I really love it. And that is a great way that the cottage food law can be used. People who want to start a business but maybe don't want the overhead or can't afford the overhead of a brick and mortar full out food establishment mm -hmm. can start with cottage foods and kind of do a market test and see how the product works, you know, how sales are, kind of get an idea of how things are gonna run. And then we've had producers who have taken it to the next level and actually opened a brick and mortar food service establishment from their cottage foods business. Or some people just really enjoy the hobby and do a fantastic job. I love to look at the things that Miss Valerie makes on Facebook. They're pretty amazing. Thank you. So. Thank you. In Extension, we really focus on three program areas. Those areas, number one, are human sciences. Secondly, is the 4-H or youth educational component. And then thirdly, the agriculture, forestry, and natural resources component uh, that has statewide responsibility. The internship program is a, a program that I'm very excited about. I know looking back on my career, I had several internship opportunities and honestly didn't realize at the time how impactful those internships were. But honestly, what it did for me was a number of things. It gave me an idea for what, it, what I wanted to do in terms of the pursuit of higher education, in terms of degrees. It gave me, a, I think, a broader picture in terms of how everything works together from a subject matter standpoint. It, it, it introduces young people to a lot of career opportunities, a lot of engagement and a lot of different uh, career areas. And more than that, I think it really gives them a foot in the door for opportunities if they want to pursue a career with us here in Extension. So you, this year you hosted <clears throat> one of Extension's first interns this summer. Yes. Tell us about that experience. That was really mm -hmm. exciting. So I did have a summer intern. Her name was Anaya mm -hmm. um, and she worked with me for 10 weeks. We actually just finished that up and she did participate some with Serve Safe and a produce safety program that we teach. Her big project was actually with home food preservation. Um, we have a new workshop that we're in the process of developing on freeze drying foods. So we did a workshop that was virtual on freeze drying and dehydrating, and we had 73 attendees live. 
and, and I was able to present a PowerPoint to those attendees on mm -hmm. the differences between freeze drying and dehydrating. So that was really exciting and she did a really good job. So I was housed in Macon County, which is Tuskegee, and I was under the mentorship of Miss Danny Reams. And I love my internship. Everyone was supportive. The work environment was amazing. Um, everyone cared and it was mostly about teamwork. It made me more decisive of what I want to do um, in my dream job of working at NASA. And I met a few people that actually have um, a food science degree that have worked at NASA. So it was great meeting those people. So why should a student maybe consider interning with Extension? So I would think that a student, number one, of course, if they're interested in a career with Extension, it would be a great idea to pursue an internship and to see, you know, if they're still interested when they see how our programs work, things are different every day. Extension is an absolutely phenomenal career, but you have to be able to adapt and adjust mm -hmm. and work with people. Um, also, if they are just interested in one of the um, programs that we offer, either from an extension standpoint or possibly even from going into an industry, because you get to experience so much and learn so much about that by interning with extension. So for ex example, Anaya, when she did her internship with us, she did a produce safety class, she did a um, serve safe class. You know, there are other classes that we offer that she could have attended, and so she learned about the extension side of it, which is incredible, and I hope that she does pursue a career yeah. in extension. But she also learned about if she wants to go into industry, these are the safety things that she needs mm -hmm. to know, um, and, and got a couple of certifications along with that. Yeah, that's really great. I think, yeah, she got some credentialing that she could take yeah. back and put on that resume. Well, thank you for all you do, and thank you for hosting us today and telling us, getting, giving us just a little glimpse of what you do every day. Well, thank y'all so much for coming and for being interested in food safety and quality with Extension. It really, really is a phenomenal place. It's been really fun to learn about it.